Hi, I'm Dr. Nina Riggins, and I'm headache neurologist and UCNS certified headache specialist. I'm director of headache and traumatic brain injury center at University of California, San Diego. And we are happy to present migraine journey through women's life with first contact American Headache Society. And I turn it over to Dr. Susan Hutchinson. Hello, I'm Dr. Susan Hutchinson, and I'm director of the Orange County Migraine and Headache Center in Irvine, California. I bring with me a background of 22 years of family medicine with a special interest in women's health, and now I have certification in headache, so now my practice is exclusively devoted to headache and mood disorders. I think it's wonderful that we have three different backgrounds here that we're sharing with you and collaborating in this presentation. And so next, I'm going to have Dr. Katherine Stitka introduce herself and she is a very esteemed OBGYN, and it's just a pleasure to have her join us. Dr. Stitka? Hi, I'm Kate Stitka. I've been an obstetrician gynecologist at Northwestern since 1990 uh, in the academic generalist practice. For the last 10 years, though, I've worked exclusively in OB triage, where I've treated women, uh, with, pregnant women with migraines, secondary headaches. Multiple times a day, I see people with, with intractable headache. Um, in addition to that, I've really benefited from at my collaboration with American uh, Headache Society, as well as um, I'm one of the three authors who recently uh, uh, worked with ACOG to publish their very first clinical practice guideline on the management of headache in pregnancy and lactation. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Riggins to begin our presentation. Thank you. This is our disclosures. And now learning objectives. They include epidemiology and pathophysiology of migraine, evidence-based migraine treatment plans that optimize to a woman's stage in life, list contraindications to particular treatments during different stages in a woman's life, identify benefits and limitations of current scientific data on management of migraine, and recognize important role of collaboration among clinicians caring for women with migraine. And next, we move into one of our nine chapters of this presentation. Migraine epidemiology can help us to facilitate diagnosis by reminding clinicians that migraine can affect women at almost any point in their life. Migraine defined. Migraine is genetic neurologic disease. It is inherited disorder which can have neurologic, sensory, autonomic, vestibular, cognitive, and gastrointestinal symptoms. It's not just a headache. Migraine prevalence among US women by age. As you can see, migraine peaks during reproductive age. Over a lifetime, migraine is approximately three times more common in women than men. Interesting fact that girls and boys migraine prevalence almost similar. Migraine classification includes two main types. Migraine without aura, about 70%, and migraine with aura. Attacks of migraine last four to 72 hours. In kids, two to 72 hours. Headache, usually on one side, moderate to severe, pulsating, aggravated by physical activity and can prevent physical activity. Headache can be accompanied by light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, nausea, and or vomiting, migraine with aura, more commonly, it is visual aura. We have excellent video which shows 
that it's not always visual symptoms. On this video, you will see example when person had speech change during migraine attack. Well, a very, very heavy, uh, heavy vertation tonight. We had a very Darison bite. Let's go to Darison those for the bit. They have the pet. Phases of migraine attack. Migraine is not just a headache. And it migraine attack can consist of few stages. Premonitory symptoms, including mood change, fatigue, neck stiffness, cognitive changes, and then stage of headache with throbbing pain, nausea, sensitivity to light, sound, smell, resolution, and postdrome can still include fatigue, cognitive changes, and neck stiffness. How do we diagnose migraine? You can use three question screener. ID migraine in the migraine diagnosis. P, photophobia. Does light bother you when you have a headache? Impairment, I. Has headache limited activity for one or more days in the last three months? N, nausea. Are you sick to your stomach when you have a headache? Yes to two or three of these questions gives us 93% that this person has migraine. So pin the migraine diagnosis. Treatments of migraine, acute treatment of migraine include different classes of medications. Some of them specifically targeted therapies. Triptans, we have seven triptans and we will discuss it in more detail shortly. Ergots, small molecule CGRP receptor antagonist, Japans. We have Ubrojapan and Remedjapan. Titan, Lasmiditan, which is agonist of 5-HT1F receptor. We do have non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which can be helpful, especially for mild to moderate symptoms. They include diclofenac, naproxen. We have combination analgestics, acetaminophen, aspirin, and caffeine. We can consider antiemetics, especially for patients with severe nausea or vomiting, and consider neuromodulatory devices when patient prefers non-drug intervention or maybe drugs ineffective, intolerable, or contraindicated. It is great to have triptan selection. Let's discuss a few highlights. Somatriptan, the only triptan with subcutaneous option. If someone taking propranolol, we recommend to use half a dose of risotriptan. Elitriptan, potent, preferred in real impairment. Zolmitriptan, one of two triptans available as nasal spray. Other one is sumatriptan. Almatriptan is oral tablet, favorable safety and tolerability. And longest acting triptans are frovotriptan with half-life of 26 hours and naratriptan with half-life of 6.5 hours. Drug targeting migraine, calcitonin gene related peptide, CGRP. This peptide wildly expressed in central nervous system, trigeminal vascular system, and dura. Actions include vasodilation, inflammation, and pain transmission. Preventive treatment of migraine. We have classes of drugs we use, some of them known as blood pressure medication, such as candesartan, beta blockers, metoprolol, propranolol, timolol, anticonvulsant medications, tapiramate, valproic acid, CGRP antagonist, remedjapan, atogepan, small molecules, and then we have CGRP monoclonal 
antibodies. Right now, FDA approved four of them. Three of the four given subcutaneously, and one is IV infusion. We also have our tricyclic antidepressants, and they could be effective in many patients. We consider onobotulinum toxin A for patients with chronic migraine. The patient who have 15 or more days of headache a month might benefit from that. Happy to present neuromodulation devices. FDA cleared for acute and preventive migraine treatment. First one, transcutaneous supraorbital nerve stimulation. FDA cleared for acute and preventive, and now available even without prescription. Second one, external combined occipital and trigeminal neurostimulation. So this device recently cleared by FDA for acute treatment. Next one, single pulse transcutaneous magnetic stimulation. FDA cleared for acute and preventive migraine management. Remote electrical neuromodulation. This is a first smartphone control device. It goes on the arm and it's cleared by FDA for acute migraine management. Non-invasive vagal nerve stimulation. It's cleared by FDA for acute and preventive migraine management. There's also study that this device reduce migraine days and analgesic use in menstrual related migraine. Biobehavioral therapies. They supported by data. They endorsed in US headache consortium guidelines. They have long lasting benefits, effective at all life stages. They can stand alone or combine with other therapies. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Susan Hutchinson. Thank you, Dr. Riggins. It's my pleasure now to look specifically at some women's issues in regards to migraine. This first section we're calling migraine and menstruation. So when we take a look at hormonal changes across the menstrual cycle, it's important to see what kind of effect that can have in our women patients with migraine. First, I think it's worth pointing out that for about 33% of women with migraine, the onset of their migraine actually coincides with menarche. About 60 to 70% will report attacks associated with menses. And then as this graph depicts declining estrogen levels, as we see just before menses, this can be an incredible vulnerable time. And we have a pretty dramatic increase in attack frequency that coincides with the declining estrogen levels. Let's take another look at migraine and estrogen. It's not just declining estrogen levels just before menses. There are other situations as well including the pill-free week in women that are on cyclical hormonal contraception. In addition, women who have a bilateral oophorectomy and they're not given estrogen replacement, that also can be a vulnerable time for an increase in migraine. And then for some women, ovulation can be a vulnerable time. And then when you look at women that have pure menstrual migraine, meaning they're only triggered, their only time they have migraine is with menses, hormonal prophylaxis can be quite effective for that. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in following slides. Let's step back for a moment and let's define what is menstrual migraine. Well, by definition, it's migraine attacks that occur in what we call the perimenstrual window. And that's defined as negative two to plus three of the menstrual cycle. So somewhere between two days before menses up to three days of the onset of menses. And that has to occur about 66% of the time. So not 100% of the time. So it's helpful if a woman is keeping a headache diary or journal so you can see if she's meeting that threshold of 66%. But it's not necessary to make the diagnosis. You can make the diagnosis by history. 
And then when you look at subtypes, the more common subtype is menstrually related migraine. These are women that have attacks throughout the cycle from other triggers, but they have this worsening during the perimenstrual window. And many women will tell you these are their worst migraines, the ones with menses. They tend to be more refractory to treatment. And then there's a smaller group called pure menstrual migraine. And these are women that only have attacks and associates with, with menses. And there you can have some very effective short-term strategy approaches. But keep in mind that most of your women have migraine attacks at other times of their cycle as well from other triggers, for example, stress, changes in barometric pressure. So what are our options for menstrual migraine? And again, keep in mind that many women will say this is their worst migraine, it's that time of the month. Well, as Dr. Riggins nicely pointed out, we have a lot of treatment options. We certainly have the oral triptans, and there have been some studies looking at short-term prevention, particularly with the longer acting triptans, such as naratriptan and frovitriptan. And the advantage of the triptans is the generics, so they're not that expensive. Certainly oral non-steroidals, whether it be prescription over the counter, those also have benefit either taken acutely or short-term prevention. We have the oral G pants that Dr. Riggins mentioned, and that also can be a role, particularly in women that can't tolerate the trip dance. Magnesium can be used, you can do it as an oral preventive, and it also can be quite effective IV for a particularly severe menstrual migraine. And then we mentioned earlier, there are hormonal approaches that can be done in evening out the estrogen. And that can be very effective, particularly for women that can safely be put on estrogen. And we'll talk more about that later. Now, what about non-oral treatment and why is that even necessary? Well, some women have incredible nausea or vomiting with their menstrual migraine, or it's rapidly escalating. And sometimes you just want something that's going to work faster and be more tolerable than something oral. So we have a lot of options. When you look at the triptan category, there's sub sumatriptan subcutaneous, and it can be given as conveniently as a auto injector. There's sumatriptan nasal spray, zolmatriptan nasal spray. And when you look at the non steroidal category, Keterlac in particular is available both intramuscular, it's also available as a nasal spray, there's anti-emetic suppositories. And then there's also nerve blocks that can be done, for example, with bupivacaine or lidocaine, very well tolerated. And it often can help the headache that day when you're giving the nerve block. And then some women may benefit from going in for an infusion, either to the emergency room or perhaps a local infusion center, such as I have in my area. And you can give them things like Keterlac, a dancitron, magnesium, and certainly just IV fluids itself can also be quite beneficial. So now let's take a little closer look at contraception because again, we think about migraine really peaking in women of childbearing years, and many of these women need or want contraception. So are there some guidelines on how to safely use contraception in women that have migraine? Well, first, when you think about migraine, and let's focus for a moment on migraine without aura. We don't want to just think about hormonal treatment. Think about non-hormonal agents, such as the triptans or the G pants or the non -steroidals. That should be the mainstay of treatment. But think about your women that have migraine without aura who need or want contraception. We strongly encourage you to use monophasic, which means all the estrogen, progesterone are the same and all the active uh, pills, and keeping that continuous so you're not having the ups and downs in hormones. And so that can be very beneficial. And then if there's a change in headache pattern, let's say you put a woman on an oral contraceptive and all of a sudden there's new onset aura, or there's a definite increase in frequency or severity, then you might consider alternatives such as progesterone only contraceptives or non-hormonal contraception. It is advisable to avoid biphasic and triphasic preparations in women with menstrual migraine, because again, we're trying to get away from any ups and downs in the ethanol estradiol or the progesterone. So that's why we use the phrase and the strong recommendation of monophasic. And optimally consider using the lower dose estrogen monophasic pills that have as low as 10 to 20 micrograms of ethanol estradiol. 
Also strongly consider back-to-back -back active pills in which you skip the placebo, because again, you're eliminating that up and down in estrogen that often can be the trigger for migraine. And also it's good to remember the hormonal vaginal ring. It comes in low estrogen amounts, such as 13 to 15 micrograms, released consistently over a three week period. And that too can be used continuously back to back. And I find women often are very appreciative of this back to back continuous, not just in terms of preventing migraine, but also just so they don't have bleeding every month. A lot of women would like to get away from that. Well, what about the increased risk of ischemic stroke? Because often that's a concern when we think about putting a woman with migraine on an estrogen containing contraceptive. Well, the progestin only pills, the odds ratio is 0.9 to one in terms of risk for ischemic stroke. When you look at the lower dose preparation, such as 20 microgram, 1.7. And what's not listed here is the 10 microgram that are now available that probably would fall somewhere in the middle there. And then the much higher birth control pills, for example, that have 50 micrograms, we rarely use. And certainly there is a dose related increased risk of ischemic stroke. So certainly try to focus on using the lower ethanol estradiol contraceptive formulations if it's appropriate in a particular woman and you feel that estrogen is safe. Unfortunately, the recommendations on combined hormonal contraceptive is not uniform when you look at organizations. At this time, the World Health Organization recommends avoiding combined hormonal contraception in women with migraine with aura. When you look at ACOG as well as USMEC, they strongly feel that combined hormonal contraception is contraindicated in migraine with aura and then when you look at the International Headache Society, it's a little bit more open in the sense that there was a consensus saying that low dose estrogen may, and I point out the word may be prescribed in migraine if women have simple visual aura. But I strongly recommend that each woman has to be evaluated individually and we should not approach all women the same when we're trying to make these decisions. So what about those women that have migraine with aura? And fortunately, most of our women have migraine without aura. So this is a smaller group, but they do have a higher risk of ischemic stroke than women that have migraine without aura. So here I would strongly recommend that you consider the progesterone only or the non-hormonal forms of contraception. And so we have progesterone only pills. There are a number of IUDs with various doses of progestin. There's injectable progestin, implants, and a non-hormonal IUD as well. So I think that should be the mainstay of contraception in women that have migraine with aura. Now, in terms of pre-pregnant discussion, why is this is important? Well, you know, again, we're treating women of childbearing years. And so if we have women that we think are at risk of pregnancy or they're wanting to get pregnant, there are some of the treatments that Dr. Riggins mentioned that we probably need to really be aware of and stop prior to the woman trying to get pregnant. Now that would include, there are two anti-epileptics, including divalproic sodium and topiramate, definitely taper and get off of those prior to pregnancy. In terms of the CGRP MABs, here's the bottom line. We just don't know enough yet. They're relatively new to the marketplace. The first one coming out in 2018, and their half-life is 27 to 31 days. Complete elimination is five half-lives. So we would recommend discontinuing any of those injectables six months before trying to conceive. Non-steroidals could interfere with contraception or con conception and implantation. So really would probably recommend starting to stay away from those as a woman was trying to get pregnant. The angiotensin receptor blockades, also known as ARBs, also recommended to stop ergot alkaloids completely contraindicated. And we would also advise against fever few with onobotulinum toxinators currently inadequate evidence. So now it's my pleasure to turn over this next section in which we're focusing on migraine and pregnancy to Dr. Katherine Stitka. Now let's turn to the woman once she becomes pregnant. The good thing about pregnancy is contrary to the 
fluctuating estradiols that Dr. Hutchinson's been talking about in terms of menstrual periods. In pregnancy, estradiol levels progressively and dramatically increase. So they, they go from a very low of about 50 picograms during the follicular phase up to a 500 fold increase um, in the third trimester at a level of about 25,000 picograms. And so as a result, the brain is stabilized by these rising estradiol concentrations. And the impact that this has on women with migraine is that they tend to improve. 50% uh, of women by the end of their first trimester have um, pretty much resolved having migraines. Um, and by the onset of the third trimester, approximately 80% of women no longer are having migraines. So what this means practically is that the preventive therapies um, can very easily be discontinued. It's not only migraineurs that have migra that present with headache, but they they clearly represent the the, the bulk of people who um, who come to OB triage or go to the emergency room or to your office. Um, more than eighty percent of people who present with headache have a pre gestational history of migraine. Um, when you're caring for these women, it's also important to remember that these women are particularly at risk for developing preeclampsia. Um, there's been softer associations with preterm birth and low birth weight uh, infants, but definitely um, through a mechanism that is not well understood, and although it may have to do with a common endothelial inflammatory pathway, uh, women with a history of migraine do have a... Uh, an increased risk of preeclampsia. So it's important to keep that in mind as you're providing care for these women. So women still do get migraine and headache and we have to know how, how do we go about treating the acutely uh, when uh, both at home as well as in the hospital. It's sad that I have to admit um, that all of these recommendations that I'm going to be talking about are not based on any kind of evidence other than one prospective randomized trial comparing IV metoclopramide with IV diphenhydramine against oral codeine. And it clearly showed that metoclopramide and diphenhydramine were, were more effective. That is the only randomized trial that has been uh, published in, in pregnant women with migraine. Everything else, and in fact, all of the things that I'm going to be discussing today are based on expert, ex, uh, expert uh, uh, opinion and, cl and clinical experience. So other, rather than being the first line therapy, being a triptan with or without a, uh, an NSAID, during pregnancy, the acute therapy, the initial therapy is a combination of acetaminophen and caffeine. Um, typically we recommend a thousand milligrams, so two extra strength acetaminophen tablets with either oral or um, with dietary caffeine or an oral formulation where acetaminophen and caffeine are combined. Uh, the caffeine is taken for its vasoconstrictive effects, um, which can certainly help uh, augment the, the analgesics effects of the acetaminophen. The sumatriptan, the triptans are considered second line therapy. Initially, a lot of people were concerned about the potential adverse effects of triptans during the first trimester on, 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 or during orga organogenesis, but a recent study has clearly shown that, that these concerns were unfounded and that there were no associated signals other than very mild hyperactivity at three years of age. Um, most of the time we recommend sumatriptan as a second line therapy because of its we just have more experience with it, but both rizotriptan and aerotriptan can be considered because of their very short half-lives. Outpatient use of metoclopramide, um, we have, is, is certainly a possibility with or without diphenhydramine. Um, they, they both come in very similar oral pre uh, preparations. We just don't have much experience with that. In contrast, that's oftentimes our primary therapy when people present either to the hospital um, or OB triage with intractable, my, with intractable headache. Other therapies that we can consider are the nerve blocks, the trigger point injections, ganglion, uh, sphenopalatine ganglion blocks, um, as well as IV magnesium. This IV magnesium I've used frequently in OB triage, but it comes a little bit down the line when people are no longer responding or have not adequately responded 
to metaclopramide and diphenhydramine, um, the acetaminophen and caffeine, or the, the triptans. Um, the concern that you'll see published about, you know, fears of um, adverse neonatal or uh, fetal effects in terms of sudden death um, are, I th are many people when they look at the literature, it was one study with that uh, the association was very, very soft. And most ob will look at you quite askance when they say there's problems with IV magnesium because we use it for short-term therapy all the time for women with preeclampsia. The other thing though that it's important is to, to emphasize non-pharmacological treatments. You know, all of the devices that people have talked about before, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, stress reduction, uh, adequate hydration, as well as sleep as a way of just helping to prevent the frequency of, of acute migraines that can affect some women in pregnancy. As you notice, nowhere on this slide is there a mention of butalbital. Um, historically, many ob including myself, have, have used um, butalbital-containing products uh, with combination of acetaminophen, caffeine, and butalbital to treat migraines in pregnancy. The uh, American College of ob has has recently come out with a recommendation that butalbital-containing products should not be used in pregnancy. And for, for the following reasons. Butalbital containing products are most associated with a situation called medication overuse headache, where women get develop a persistent continuous headache because of exposure to certain medications. And butalbital is the worst, worst, um, uh, much more complicated than even opioids. The butalbital in and of itself is not associated with any enhancement of the analgesia. In fact, it's felt that the, uh, the analgesia comes from the acetaminophen and the caffeine uh, without additional benefit from the butalbital. And um, most countries uh, around the world have, have uh, eliminated butalbital containing products for this very reason. So as a result, we are not recommending use of butalbital containing products uh, in the treatment of acute migraine in pregnancy. In terms of preventative treatment, as I've mentioned before, most often for many women, they can stop their daily preventative treatments. However, there are still going to be some women who continue to ha have frequent migraines in pregnancy. And for these women, you can offer them a beta blocker such as propranolol, an alternative is nifedipine, a calcium channel blocker, um, which has a, a very similar, if, if not perhaps better safety profile than the beta blockers. Riboflavin, the magnesium that we've talked about before, can also be used orally for prevention, as well as the, the nerve blocks, um, which are considered quite safe and well tolerated. Other types of prevention, um, you really have to counsel your patient in terms of weighing risk versus benefit. All of these medications listed here have potential uh, risks to the developing fetus, um, or we have very little uh, experience with them, such as the mamantine. Okay, when we look at women who do continue to present either to our office, or to the hospital, or to the emergency room with intractable headache, it's really interesting to look um, at what kinds of diagnoses they may have. The vast majority are people with. Uh, an intractable migraine. This is a study that was performed um, at a, a single institution in New York City over a five-year period. And 60% of the people presenting with headache for consultation um, had a history of migraine. There was an additional 6% that had uh, recurrent primary headaches that, that were non-migraine in origin. But approximately a third of women had what we call secondary headaches. About half of those were associated with preeclampsia or hypertensive disorders. And for the ob person, these are quite familiar to us. A headache accompanying preeclampsia is a very common presentation, but you can also develop other more complicated types of headaches associated with hypertensive disorders. Of concern, um, about 17% of the, the presentations were associated with other secondary headache types um, that you know, were much more complicated, were clearly 
either unrelated to pregnancy or certainly unrelated to a migraine history. And it's incumbent upon the practitioner to have a, a sensitive threshold for identifying uh, women that need additional workup and, and clearly um, alternative therapies. When we're thinking about uh, secondary headaches and how do we evaluate them, it's important to think about particular red flags that differentiate um, a headache from a, a common uncomplicated migraine that may be intractable and, and be difficult to get rid of from, from women who have a secondary headache that clearly needs um, appropriate evaluation with imaging. Um, some of those red flags are um, any kind of un atypical presentation. So women, when they get a migraine, it tends to be a very similar presentation time after time after time. And so anything that deviates from that, any kind of focal neurological uh, change that's, that's atypical needs to be uh, needs to be evaluated, as well as this is the worst headache I've ever experienced in my life, a thunderclap headache that cuts, comes suddenly out of the clear blue sky and goes from zero to 100 within a very short period of time, as well as any kind of altered consciousness or you know, fever. These are ones that, need to, that merit uh, additional evaluation. Additional evaluation most often equates to imaging. Uh, the preferred imaging um, is both because of its sensitivity and being able to identify some of these abnormalities, as well as the fact that the woman is pregnant, um, is to go to MRI. Um, and although we typically recommend against using gadolinium contrast with MRI, um, because of its, of its potential effect on the fetus, um, Organizations have come out to, to, to recommend that if you absolutely need gadolinium to enhance your, your ability to, to um, assign a diagnosis, then it's, it's not a black-white situation. It's just something that, you know, if you can avoid it, you attempt to avoid it. Um, alternatively, with, with MRs, uh, both MRV as well as MRA, you can utilize the time of flight imaging if you consult and talk with the radiologist to make sure that they um, know what you're looking for and that they are skilled in using this particular MR approach. On this slide, you can see some of the various different types of, of secondary headache that uh, require uh, imaging to assign a diagnosis. Of note, there's one time in which CT scan is um, absolutely the uh, recommended imaging, and that's when you are concerned about a stroke because most places um, are, you know, it's usually only the CT scan that you're able to achieve the uh, imaging, uh, to accomplish imaging within the 25 minutes of the patient presenting. So once the baby has been delivered, we're faced with a slightly different situation. As soon as that placenta is evacuated, as soon as the placenta uh, is delivered after the baby, you, you get a sudden and quite rapid decrease in the estrogen levels um, following its removal. And the brain, just like with um, during a menstrual cycles, becomes uh, sensitive to those, the, those rapid falls in estrogen. And it's very common for women to get recurrence of migraines in that immediate postpartum period. The other type of headache that's very commonly associated with, with the, the peripartum period is a low pressure headache after epidural or spinal uh, injection. This headache, for those of us in OB, we know it very well. Um, it is postural, it's worse when women try to stand up, it improves with supine position. You immediately call your anesthesiologist, uh, anesthesiologist in for a consultation. And typically they're treated with either blood patches and some combination of caffeine. Let's now then turn to lactation and breastfeeding. There's actually a very clear association with uh, breastfeeding and stabilization of migraines, at least for a period of time in the immediate postpartum period. And that's because once those, uh, those estradiol levels fall immediately postpartum, breastfeeding with its associated lactation amenorrhea uh, 
keeps those estradiol levels in a low, but certainly stable position. And for a while, because you no longer have, you, you don't have fluctuations in estradiol, this can really help prevent uh, return of migraines. However, it's transitory um, as estradiol levels start rising and begin fluctuation um, before re return of menstrual periods. That's when you can get a recurrence of the migraine, uh, migraine attacks in, in, in these women. So what can we use to treat them with when, when women are lactating? Pretty much acutely, you, you can use the same therapies that we use when people are not pregnant or not breastfeeding. There's only a couple of, of exceptions to that. So clearly the triptans can be used, your NSAIDs, your analgesics, your ibuprofen, acetaminophens, you know, your antiemetics, all can be used. You have to bear in mind a little bit in terms of exposure to the fetus, especially with some of your antiemetics potentially, as well as your triptans. However, <clears throat> what's important to remember is that very little of, especially with the triptans, very little of them come across um, to the, the fetus in, in the breast milk. Although you'll still see in the product labeling uh, recommendations that you should avoid uh, breastfeeding for 12 hours after sumatriptan and 24 hours after some of the other triptans. Although sumatriptan actually, I uh, stand correct, it can be eight to 12 hours in their labeling. It's also important to recommend that many of the devices and the non-pharmacological non therapies can be very much, can be very beneficial um, for women uh, when they're lactating. There are two things that we should avoid. That's the regular strength aspirin. Um, it's, sec it's clearly secreted um, into, into breast milk. It can be associated potentially with, with infant rye syndrome, um, but the baby aspirin is okay. And the other medication you should avoid are the ergots because they have uh, both the potential to suppress lactation um, through their effect on dopamine, as well as the, um, they can, they're associated with, with some adverse neonatal effects such as nausea and, and, um, and fatigue. Now turning to prevention while breastfeeding, um, some of the same principles that we used in terms of, you know, what's safe during pregnancy is, is also going to be safe during breast, breastfeeding. And the, clearly the, the medications that we want to avoid because of its adverse uh, fetal effect, we also similarly want to avoid them during lactation because of the potential for transference to the neonate. So once again, we clearly uh, emphasize the non-drug approaches and, and, and clearly use of procedures um, to help prevent uh, my migraine frequency. And then if you are going to use any kind of prevention, it's just really important to start low and increase gradually and watch for the adverse effects on the infant. And with that, we're going to turn the mic back over to Dr. Hutchinson and she'll address management of migraine in women during the perimenopause and menopause period. Thank you so much, Dr. Stitka. Let's take a few moments now and take a look at now an older woman. She's already done with pregnancy, breastfeeding, raising her children, and now she's hitting perimenopause. I've often heard of that called the change before the change. And during this time, there is often variability in migraine. This is thought to be secondary to estrogen fluctuation. And when we look at migraine attack frequency, it's increased during this time in women's life compared to premenopause. This increase is experienced by 40% of women with migraine during perimenopause and up to 70% during the late stage of perimenopause. Now, when we look at postmenopause, in which women are completely done with menses, it's been at least 12 months of no spontaneous bleeding. For many, this is often associated with a reduction or cessation in migraine attacks. Why? We believe it's due to the fact that now we have low but stable estrogen levels. However, some of these women that are postmenopausal may worsen and they may actually benefit from hormonal treatment. So once again, it needs to be an individual approach with each woman in our practice. So what about hormonal replacement therapy? Well, if we look at menopausal women with migraine without oral, this can be quite beneficial for some. And in particular, the transdermal delivery, for example, with an estradiol patch. This can be better at maintaining a constant serum estradiol level versus using an oral estrogen pill. 
And there was one study showing there may be a therapeutic threshold in that a 100 microgram transdermal estradiol may be more effective than a 50 microgram. And as this graph shows, when you look at status after hormonal replacement therapy in this particular study that was published in Women Without Aura, there was actually no change in about 57%, 21% worse, and 23% improved. So once again, an individual approach with each woman as you're making decisions about estrogen and there's a history of migraine is very important. So now it's my pleasure to turn it back to Dr. Nina Rickens as we wrap up. And she's going to be talking about migraine and older patients. Thank you. Migraine continues to evolve in older adults. Migraine features are likely to be atypical. Pain can be bilateral. It can be less sensitivity to light, sound. Person can have less nausea than in the past. Aura may present without any headache. In this case, we need careful assessment to exclude secondary headache, such as stroke. Migraine is associated with new onset of hypertension in postmenopausal women. In summary, migraine is highly prevalent in women, especially during childbearing years. The approach to migraine treatment should depend on the stage of women's life. Migraine therapy should include strategy for acute and preventive treatment. It is important to use evidence-based strategy. And healthcare providers should collaborate when treating women with migraine. So when you're looking for resources on treatment of migraine in women, please refer to First Contact American Headache Society. We are here for you. On behalf of First Contact American Headache Society, we are very grateful for you taking your time and listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, please leave us a comment. It's been a pleasure to spend this time with all of you. And we all hope that this brief presentation will help you uh, better care for your patient with migraine throughout all phases of her life. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.